Hello and welcome. I'm Lisa Almo, Community Relations Representative with the Lakeshore. Many of you have perhaps visited the Lakeshore previously, and for those of you who are less familiar, I would like to take the opportunity to share with you that we are a premier retirement community that sits on the south shore of beautiful Lake Washington. We have 156 senior apartment homes offering a variety of studio, one bedroom and two bedroom floor plan options. Right now, we are moving new residents into the community and we are able to do full community tours via FaceTime, Zoom or other virtual ways as well as in person. If you're interested in learning more about the Lakeshore, interested in a tour or making a reservation, please feel free to contact Jane, Alicia or myself in the community relations office. I also want to be sure you are aware of an extraordinary partnership the Lakeshore and Era Living's other seven communities have with the University of Washington. Our residents benefit from this partnership to deliver innovative programs designed with healthy living in mind. The partnerships lie with the Farm School of Pharmacy, the School of Social Work, and the School of Nursing, who we are hearing from today. For nearly three decades, Era Living has pioneered a powerful relationship with top-ranked University of Washington School of Nursing. The partnerships allow our residents to benefit from evidence-informed wellness and active aging programs. Before we get to the main event, I'd like to introduce to you again, Tack Waltz, resident at the Lakeshore. Tack is a retired nurse who was in the field for 30 years at Santa Rosa County Hospital in California. I'll let Tack tell you a little more about how she lived, how she likes living at the Lakeshore, and she will introduce to, out, to you to our speaker today. Take it away, Tack. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I graduated from the University of Washington School of Nursing way back in 1954. I arrived here at Lakeshore from California on November 1st, 2019. I love the location and setting of here, um, the maintenance of the ground and garden are immaculate. I even found my favorite bush here, the Daphne. The dining room is very elegant, lovely chandelier, white tablecloth with flowers, and a beautiful view of Lake Washington. Both residents and employees are very kind and friendly, even the directors. <laughs> The directors do a wonderful job keeping us happy. We have uh, interesting lectures, exercise classes, arts and craft, and we hope to be able to get back to doing it together. Today we have Dr. Jean Tong. She is a psychiatric and mental health nurse practitioner and a sleep research scientist. She is an um, associate professor at the University of Washington School of Nursing. She will speak today on sleep and aging. We are delighted to have you, Dr. Tang. Here you are, <laughs> Dr. Tang. Thank you so much, Lisa and Tug. What a great honor to be introduced by another Husky nurse. Thank you. Um, so let me share my screen um, with people so you can all see. Um, are you able to see my screen, uh, the presentation? Thank you. Thank you for the nodding and the cues. Again, it's my great honor to be here um, to talk about sleep. Um, sleep is one of my favorite topic to talk about. It's, um, it has been part of my research and um, I work in mental health. So um, sleep is one of the uh, crucial vital sign um, we always assess in mental health um, and a good sleep is important for uh, well-being. So, and um, 
preparation for today's talk, I thought, you know, what are some of the common um, things people would like to know about sleep? So here's our, what I prepared. Um, so usually um, people would like to know how much sleep is considered adequate. And, um, and, and then, you know, are there any tips um, to promote sleep? And in order to, um, to really understand why those tips um, work, we need to know um, how does sleep work, okay? And then um, I would like to spend some time kind of talk about some of the simple way that we can do to assess sleep. And then, you know, if there's any uh, sleep issue, how, how do we communicate with our providers about our sleep issue? And then, um, so um, I will um, go through these um, areas. And then if there's any other topics about sleep you would like to discuss, um, we, we can talk about it uh, at the end of this discussion. So first of all, um, how much sleep do I really need? That, that is a common question people um, often ask. And um, to, to answer that, I thought, you know, this uh, graph by Sleep, um, National Sleep Foundation is a great reference. It, um, it's, it provides some visual uh, illustration in terms of the average sleep um, across lifespan. And if you look at this graph, um, we see that um, newborns spend a majority of their um, time in a day in sleep. And then as people get older, um, the need for sleep started to decrease. But um, this, de uh, this re reduction in the need uh, for sleep started to kind of plateau starting um, at young adulthood around age 20. And then it started to plateau, okay? And then, um, and so as we get um, to the older age, the recommended sleep, uh, average sleep per, per night is um, around seven to eight hours. And for those of um, you who can see this graph, um, you, may, you may ask, wait, well, there's a dip, you know, um, how come there's a dip when it comes to um, uh, age 65 or older? Uh, what's with this? Okay, so um, there are a couple reasons why there's a dip um, when we get older in terms of um, the, the average hours of sleep. Um, and it's not necessarily mean that um, older people need less sleep. It's um, one of the uh, reason, you know, when why there's a dip is that when we get older, there's this biological and physiological changes um, happen with aging that tend to um, change um, our sleep pattern. And the other thing is um, when we get older, um, we, we tend to have more medical conditions um, and that could impair sleep as well. So um, I would say the take home message looking at this, this uh, graph is um, to know that um, the numbers of sleep we need um, started to settle around um, age 20 and they started to plateau and acknowledge that there, you know, uh, there are some biological and physiological normal aging um, changes um, that occur when we get older and that could impair sleep. Um, yeah, so, so, uh, so that's that. And then that's um, look deeper in terms of how does aging affect sleep? When we get older, there tends to be a shift in terms of our circadian rhythm, uh, meaning um, it actually the, the, the pattern of our sleep actually uh, shift forward in time. And this shift is often called a phase advance when it comes to the sleep medicine term, sleep uh, a phase advance. 
meaning um, when we get older, we tend to feel um, tired easily um, early um, in the afternoon instead of night. And then we tend to wake up early um, than when we were in the adulthood. And then um, with this change, there's also um, change in our sleep architecture, meaning um, the cycles that we went through when we are sleeping. Uh, when we get older, we tend to, um, when we are um, sleeping, we tend to spend more time in the lighter stage of sleep and less time in the deeper uh, stage of sleep. That's the REM sleep um, stage. And with that kind of cycle um, and change and um, age, you know, uh, aging related architecture change, people tend to wake up more easily at night and have more interrupted sleep because of the um, sleep ar architecture change. And then there's also daytime napping. Um, there is a, a research show that um, older people, about 25% of older people have uh, this uh, habit of taking daytime napping as compared to um, average 8% in uh, adults. So, um, and although, you know, some people would say, well, there's a benefit of daytime napping, um, which is, which is, you know, is, is, can be beneficial um, in many cases, and that is fine. Um, but I would say to um, limit the daytime napping to less than one hour and not to take the daytime napping too late in the day. Um, otherwise, it's going to uh, inter in interfere with the sleep pressure building throughout the day. And we will talk more about it as we go. Um, and also as we get older, uh, it, it takes longer for our body to recover uh, from any changes. Um, when it comes to sleep uh, schedule, it um, say, you know, if, if, if there is a, um, if we're traveling across the time zone, it may take our body longer to recover. Um, or if um, uh, for daytime saving um, change, um, usually that even that one hour um, change, um, it takes our body uh, one week to two weeks to readjust to, a, uh, to the new pattern. So these are some of the common um, changes um, that comes with aging um, about sleep. And um, I would say, you know, recognize these factors and then, um, and then kind of find a way um, for self-care. And we can, we can talk about it um, uh, later in, in this uh, talk. So these are normal changes that comes with aging. And then um, next, let's take a look in terms of some of the health conditions uh, that also have the potential to interrupt sleep. Um, these are some of the common ones. Um, pain uh, is a common one. Um, arthritis in um, old age, uh, people often complain, you know, they turn um, in sleep and then um, the pain kind of wake them up um, in the middle of the night, okay? Um, or people with heart condition or prostate issue, the frequent um, bath, uh, bathroom visit at night can interfere sleep as well. And also uh, people um, who have uh, GERD, um, the, the stomach acid reflux at night may, may um, irritate their uh, throats, um, trigger cough, and um, some wakefulness during the nighttime. And a lot of time, people are not aware that their sleep issue is related to um, a managed GERD issue. So um, that's something uh, worthwhile putting it on our radar uh, to consider. 
um, if there is a sleep issue and then there is also unmanaged GERD symptoms. Um, people with uh, who are going through menopause or postmenopause, uh, the changes in hormone, nice wet, um, the changes in uh, sleep architecture can interrupt sleep. Or um, people with dementia. Um, the thing with dementia is um, the prodromal phase of dementia can be as long as um, 10, 15 years. And sleep. Uh, is one of the early clinical symptoms for dementia or cognitive impairment. Um, so, and as people going through um, the, the phases of um, dementia, especially toward the middle or late stage, there uh, there's uh, usually a, a significant change in sleep pattern in terms of day and night um, upside down, um, people tend to, uh, people living with dementia tend to sleep um, during the daytime and um, waking up um, in, in the, um, at nighttime, or um, they may have fragmented sleep pattern. There's also this sundowning um, that related, associate with um, behavioral disturbance. Um, and and then the other thing is with dementia, uh, the sleep um, impact is not only to uh, people who are living with dementia, it also impacts um, on people who are in the caregiver role, who are taking care of people living with dementia. Because um, if you have um, a loved one, a family members um, who are uh, wandering around at night um, it, it's really hard to have a sound sleep um, when you're living in the same um, uh, the same household um, or in the same environment uh, with someone um, whose sleep is interrupted. And then also some mental health uh, condition um, can interfere with sleep. Um, people with uh, depressed mood or anxiety uh, sometimes the ruminating thoughts, the worry at night um, can um, uh, make it really hard for people to fall asleep or um, people tend to wake up in the middle of the night for no reason and start starting to have those ruminating worrisome thoughts. Um, or people with post-traumatic stress disorders, um, the nightmare um, can um, uh, keep people um, awake um, in the middle of the night. So the reason we are talking about these is if, um, if, you know, if the root of the sleep issue is, um, is from one of the medical condition, the medical condition needs to be addressed first. Um, jumping right into sleep medication, it's not the answer. So, um, so I wanted to talk about this. Um, so this is on um, people's radar and um, so they can help their, um, uh, if you have sleep issue, then um, your provider team will need this information to, um, to, to pinpoint the cause of the sleep um, disturbance. Okay. So now um, let's talk about how does sleep work, okay? Um, there are two regulating processes that um, kind of help us uh, uh, sleep well. One of the sleep uh, fact, uh, mechanism is um, the sleep pressure, okay? And then uh, it has something to do with how long we have been awake. The longer we are awake, the higher the sleep pressure is. And the second one is circadian rhythm. Um, that's you know the timing um, in which our body are more in tune to sleep. And I'm gonna um, walk you through each of the process. Uh, the first one, sleep pressure. Um, so this is an illustration of 
after one good night of sleep, when we wake up in the morning feeling really refreshed, the sleep pressure is at its lowest point. Okay. Um, we, we, we don't feel sleepy at all. We feel we have enough energy to go through the day. And as we go through the day, um, we engage in daily activity, you know, we get kind of started to feeling a little bit tired, especially in the late afternoon. And, you know, we kind of go through the evening and then the sleep pressure, the, the sleepiness hit the highest when we get closer to our bedtime, okay? And then we go to, we go to sleep and throughout the, throughout the night with good sleep, um, the sleep pressure started to deflate. And then we go through this cycle every day. And with the sleep pressure building, any activity, any factor that could deflate the pressure building um, would have the potential to interfere with the sleep at night. Okay, so um, factor that could um, deflate uh, the sleep pressure includes, say, um, taking too long of the nap um, during the daytime. Okay, that because that would depressure this um, buildup, or too late in the day. Okay. Um, or uh, drinking too much, too much coffee, caffeine um, type of beverage um, during the, the daytime. So those could interfere with the pressure building. Okay. The other thing that could interfere with the pressure building is um, staying in bed too long, you know, longer than we need to. The one of the principles to promote uh, good sleep is um, using the bed only for sleep and sex, um, not other thing, you know, any other thing. Um, if, we, if we don't feel sleepy, um, we want to um, get out of the bed. And then we can talk more about the rationale later, okay. And then um, the other process is um, circadian rhythm, okay. Um, in our brain, there's this um, structure called suprachiasmatic nucleus. That's where um, our internal biological clock um, is managed. And then um, it's this internal biological clock is really synchronized with the sun and the moon, or you would say with the light and darkness. Um, how does this internal invisible biological clock get adjusted or regulated? Largely, it's by the light stimulation. So during the daytime, when there's, uh, when it's bright outside, uh, when there's a daylight, the light stimulation get absorbed through our eyes and then the light stimulation get transmitted through our optical nerve um, to the suprachiasmatic nucleus in our brain. And that kind of stimulation kind of, you know, um, help to regulate the wakefulness signals in our brain, those hormones and neurotransmitters. And as we, we go through the day and, and um, um, in the evening when outside started to get darker, um, then uh, there's less light stimulation to our brain. And that kind of triggers the secretion of melatonin um, in the evening. And that prepare us um, for the nighttime sleep. And this melatonin secretion and preparation for evening sleep, it can take up to four to five hours. Um, so, so that kind of um, give us a reminder in terms of setting a bedtime routine um, and you know, allowing our body to get into that relaxation phase and um, be ready for sleep um, at our bedtime. So um, how do we work with this uh, kind of circadian rhythm? Um, the tip is, you know, if during the daytime, 
engage in daytime activity as much as you can, and then allow um, the light stimulation um, on the uh, on the good weather day. If you can go out, um, enjoy the outs uh, um, outdoor and the daylight. Even if you have to stay indoor. Um, uh, open the blind so there is more daylight into the room to help um, regulate this uh, invisible internal biological clock. And at night, avoid um, exposure to strong flashing type of light, including those from the computer, tablet, uh, or, or television. Okay. So, um, so that's the two um, uh, regulating processes that we uh, about sleep. Now let's talk about sleep hygiene 101 and then things that we can do on our own as um, a way uh, for self care. And then um, I'm gonna talk about some of the rationale why. Um, so the first one is stick to sleep schedule. And, um, and we were talking about sleep pressure. We were talking about circadian rhythm. And, and our body, human body is built to this 23 to 24 hours of cycle. Uh, so uh, sticking to a sleep uh, schedule in terms of getting up um, at the um, same time each day going to bed around the same time each day um, is helpful to help um, our body regulate and promote better sleep. And also um, exercise. Um, exercise, you know, when we exercise, it helps to um, promote our um, blood circulation. And, um, and then with exercise, it helps to promote um, the regulation of various hormones in our body. And it, send, it sends a signal to our brain that it is doing, it, it is daytime and, um, and we need to stay awake for those activity. Um, and having that kind of um, routine in our day-to-day um, -day cycle, help to separate the daytime versus nighttime. So um, exercise is an is important activity um, in that regulation. Um, but I, you know, I wouldn't recommend people exercising too late in the day because um, oftentimes if um, after um, a period of exercise, it takes our body some time to, um, to, to unwind and relax again. So um, I would say exercise um, early, in the, uh, early in the day if you can and, uh, and not too close to the bedtime. The other thing is um, caffeine uh, intake. This seems to be a no brainer, but um, a lot of people may not know the half-life of caffeine, meaning um, how much time it would take for our body to um, get rid of 50% of the caffeine if we indulge in one cup of caffeinated beverage. The half time for caffeine for human body is um, eight hours. So uh, meaning, you know, if I, I have a cup of coffee or tea caffeinated around noontime, um, by 8 p.m. tonight, I still have some caffeine in my body, in my system. Um, so, uh, so that would be something for people to consider if um, caffeine beverage is one of their routine um, to be mindful in terms of um, the timing of um, caffeine intake. Um, and also in terms of the um, alcohol consumption, um, a lot of people um, use uh, uh, alcohol as a sleep inducer, which makes sense because alcohol is um, a central nervous um, depressant. 
So it helps people to get into that twilight zone, relax, so um, for sleep onset. However, um, with alcohol, alcohol can uh, trigger this rebound um, in with our brain waves. So um, as alcohol wears out in our body, you know, usually it's after um, uh, four to five hours of um, of um, the the alcohol consumption. Um, our our brainwave, you know, actually kick into a high gear, um, and with that, it wakes people up. So, um, if people um, are taking alcohol um, as a sleep sleep inducer, but then having difficulty um, maintaining sleep, you know, or, or having issues, you know, waking up in the middle of the night, that could be the cause. So um, is, you know, I would say moderate alcohol, alcohol um, intake um, uh, should be considered. And then um, um, avoiding large meals um, or beverage at night. Um, if we drink too much of um, fluid late at night, then um, that would set us up for um, frequent bathroom visit. Um, avoiding large meals um, at night um, is so that it allows more uh, um, so the blood circulation into our brain for uh, restoration. And also this is to avoid um, a situation like GERD that could impair um, our sleep. And also kind of pay attention to the type of medication um, we are on. Um, some of the medication have the potential to interrupt our sleep, um, including stimulant for attention deficit disorder or um, any medication that could promote urination. Um, so if, if, you know, if you notice that your sleep pattern change, after there's some adjustment with some of your sleep, uh, uh, some of your medication, then um, I would make a note and discuss with your provider um, to see if the sleep issue is related to the medication you're taking for other uh, medical condition. And then we talk about not to take nap too late in the in the day. Um, we also to touch base a little on um, develop a bedtime routine. We talk about um, allowing time um, uh, at night um, and also for the melatonin, the natural melatonin um, uh, our body uh, released to help us ease into um, the nighttime sleep. So uh, things people can do to, um, to prepare this um, bedtime routine uh, is, um, you know, do some meditation or um, stretching exercise. However, it will help um, your body relax before that uh, bedtime um, is good. Um, or take a warm bath, one for circul blood circulation. The other is, um, you know, after taking a warm bath, uh, there's our bodies, um, the temperature will start it to kind of cool down. That cool down process actually helps um, the sleep onset. And that, um, and that you know, um, uh, translate to um, if if we're on the plane and it's a uh, it's a long flight, if um, sometimes they turn actually turn down uh, the cabin temperature to help passengers sleep better, because um, the cool cool temperature actually um, help to promote sleep. Um, so we want our bedroom to um, be dark because that's a that's you know that's a cue for our brain that it's dark out now. We need it's, it's sleep time, and um, the the environment the cooler envi environment um, is um, better for sleep. And then um, make our bedroom uh, gauge free. 
um, uh, gadget free um, and mainly uh, electronic devices that would um, that that has the blue light because that can impair the secretion of melatonin. And then we also have uh, talk about during the daytime have uh, the proper sunlight exposure. Again, that's that gives our brain some cue in terms of uh, the day and night um, regulation. Um, and then we will talk about why not laying in bed um, awake later in the later part of this talk. Okay. So if unfortunately um, you have some sleep issue and you would like to talk to your doctor about your sleep, here are some things that um, some of the, the elements that I would encourage you to kind of um, uh, make a note, either a mental note or write it down in preparation for your discussion with your provider. Because whenever you know it comes to sleep, um, your doctor, you know, are likely um, want to know what type of sleep issue do you have, whether you were having trouble falling asleep, or staying asleep, or waking up too early. Okay. Some people may have one or uh, one or more um, sleep issues around this, but um, it's important for you to think about what what type of sleep um, difficulty do I have? Um, the reason for for knowing this is um, having this information is going to help um, your treatment team. Uh, plan for uh, a good uh, treatment plan for you because the various sleep medication um, there there are very different medic sleep medication work for different subtype uh, depending on the medication half-life so knowing the subtype is very um, helpful and then if you can pinpoint the exact numbers of um, hours of sleep you have, that's helpful too. One, it provides your provider a baseline in terms of um, your current um, sleep number. And, um, and then, and then com compare over time in terms of the treatment um, improvement. And then, um, and so, so in terms of the uh, uh, knowing the hours of sleep here are some of the um, elements that um, you can kind of write down. And I recommend people to do it over seven days because a lot of time, one time, one, one night is not enough as an index. So um, in sleep medicine, um, a seven day of kind of sleep diary type is very helpful to 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 uh, for the your treatment team to understand the pattern. So we want to know what time do you go to bed, and what time um, did you get out of the bed each each day, and then what time did you actually um, fall asleep, uh, and what time did you wake up? Because um, it has different meaning. The first part is, you know, it, it tells people how much time you stay in bed. The second part tells people how much, how many hours you actually spend in sleep. And knowing these um, elements will help your treatment team to calculate the sleep uh, efficiency. Um, and then from there, um, they are better to help you. And also, um, sleep quality. Um, sleep is a very subjective thing. Um, I can look at the number I say, and I say, well, eight hours, not bad. Um, you know, I, I don't think you have any problem with sleep. But um, you could tell me that, yeah, I get eight, eight hours of sleep, but I'm not happy with my sleep because my sleep quality is not good. 
So um, sleep is very much like pain. There's not, you know, there's no um, scientific way to measure it and say, yeah, you know, I think you have a good night's sleep or not. So it's a very subjective. And then um, the doctors are counting on, um, on you to provide such in information, to provide your perspective in terms of what do you think about uh, your sleep quality? And then, um, and then one thing, uh, one easy way to tell is, uh, do you wake up in the morning feeling refreshed and ready um, and feeling you have enough energy to carry out the activity um, during the day? And that leads to the second part, the daytime functioning, uh, whether um, how is your concentration, um, your daily functioning level and energy level. So, so these are the element um, provider usually would like to know when um, their patient complaining about sleep. Okay. So now let's take a look in turn, um, about some of the common sleep disorders and ways that we can kind of self-assess um, in preparation for our uh, appointments uh, with our provider to talk about sleep. In terms of the insomnia, there's this um, standard uh, scale that are um, often used, but in the previous uh, slide, we kind of walk through this, right? We talk about um, the type of sleep and whether there's um, a daytime functioning impairment. And actually diagnostically, um, this is how insomnia is defined. Okay, and that's why um, I, you know, I mentioned that this information is important. Okay. So that's insomnia. And then um, while we are on insomnia, um, I would like to talk about the standard treatment for insomnia. Um, oftentimes people, you know, when people think about, okay, sleep issue, the, uh, there's this tendency to jump right into the medication. I need some medication for sleep, okay. Um, but the thing is, you know, um, the, the, the first line treatment for insomnia is not medication. Actually, it is cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. It's something non-pharmacological rather than medication, okay? Um, and what is uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia? Um, there, um, I'm looking at my time, yeah. I think we have enough time for me to quickly go through this. The CBTI. Um, for people who have chronic insomnia, there's usually over time people um, tend to have this fear or worry about their sleep. Um, in the worst scenario, um, when it gets dark outside, close to the evening time, people tend to start feeling really anxious, uh, thinking about, oh my goodness, is, is it going to be another night of tossing and turning? I don't want to live through that, you know, having another night of um, tossing and turning, not able to sleep while the rest of the world seems not to have any trouble sleeping. So over time, there's this cognitive condition about when they think about sleep, there's this worry and, um, and fear. Um, so in CBTI, one of the uh, treatment is to kind of reframe that worrisome thoughts about sleep. And then there's also behavioral component um, in terms of the stimulic, stimulus control. It means go to bed only when sleepy, um, get out of the bed um, uh, when unable to sleep for uh, more than 30 minutes. Okay, so that's the magic number. If people are tossing and turning, unable to sleep for 30 minutes, the, the recommendation is to get out of the bed, go to another room, engage in um, 
an activity that is relaxing. And when, uh, when, when feeling sleepy, then go back to the bedroom. The reason for that is that so to train our brain. So when we look at the we, we look at bed, it associate the bed with sleep, a good night's sleep, rather than something that's worrisome or fear of an, another night of insomnia. And then we, we talk about the sleep hygiene 101. And then there is also uh, sleep restriction. What it is, is um, kind of, because we talk about the, the time we spend in bed in versus the time we actually spend in sleep. We want the time spent in bed is more closely in line with uh, the time we uh, spend sleeping. Um, and that's why uh, with this, it is, you know, uh, recommended people not to uh, not to stay in bed um, if they cannot sleep. And then if CBTI is not working, then um, usually people bring medication on board. And, um, and with enough inf information, your provider will be able to uh, find a good match in terms of, you know, a good medication that will work for your type of insomnia, if that's the case. Okay. So um, we talk about, you know, restless leg syndrome is um, one of the common sleep disorder. Um, here are uh, four questions that we can easily do to kind of self screen uh, for uh, restless leg syndrome. So the four questions are, um, do you move your legs because of discomfort or disagreeable sensation in your leg? Uh, yes or no. Do you move or rub your legs to relieve the discomfort? Yes or no. Are these discomfort uh, symptoms worse at rest, but relieved at least temporarily by activity? Yes or no. Um, and are these symptoms worse later in the day or at night? And if people answer yes, to all four questions, then there's likelihood, um, you know, we need to look into whether restless leg syndrome um, is, 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 um, is there. So that will be something you need to discuss uh, with your provider, okay? Um, and then the other is um, obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. Um, or, or in short, sleep apnea. So this is an uh, illustration of um, in a normal aging uh, airway, the, the, the air flows through um, smoothly, no problem. But uh, in the case of sleep apnea, this part of the structure is uh, collapsed not allowing air to flow through freely. And that caused um, uh, kind of um, the, the, it limits the circulation and oxygen exchange in our body to our heart, to our brain and, um, and impair sleep. If, if, the issue, if, if the sleep issue is caused by this structural change, um, sleep medicine can only help very little in this situation. The structure um, issue needs to be addressed um, in order for sleep uh, to improve. So, um, and then there's, here's a little um, neat questionnaire that people can do to kind of self-assess to see um, their, whether they're at risk for sleep um, apnea. The questions are, um, do you snore loudly? Um, and yes or no. Do you often feel tired um, during the daytime? Um, or, you know, has anyone, you know, mentioned that um, you have the tendency to stop breathing during the sleep? Um, or do you have um, high blood pressure? 
And then also, um, if you know, uh, a heavier weight is a risk factor, age is a risk factor, um, a, a larger neck circumference is a risk factor, and uh, male gender uh, is a risk, uh, a risk factor. And if people answer yes on three or more, uh, there's a high risk for sleep apnea. Um, so, um, so this is a nice self-assessment people can do. Um, and then if, 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 um, if you think you're at high risk and you hit a lot of yes on this, um, I would suggest um, speaking to your provider, especially if you have um, sleep issue. So that concludes my, my, my uh, discussion about sleep. Um, I do want to um, bring your attention to this uh, wonderful resource uh, by National Sleep Foundation. On their website, they have a special um, page dedicated for sleep and aging. They have wonderful resources. Um, so, um, so I would encourage people to, to visit their website. There's also uh, a lot of resources through National Institute of Health uh, or uh, Cleveland uh, Clinic. And since we talk about CBTI as the first line treatment for insomnia, uh, there are some self-help uh, books and then books for a clinician um, if you're interested. So that's the end of my, my talk and I'm oh. open for questions. Oh, Dr. Tang? Yes. May, my, may I share a, a, a personal experience I've had recently? I have glaucoma and I've been taking eye drops for many years. And about a month ago on a Friday, the, the ophthalmologist took me off my eye drops. And on Saturday, I slept well. And I continue to sleep well, seven to eight hours a night. And it's a godsend. I'm not taking eye drops again. <laughs> That's a great example of how, um, how in tune you are in terms of, you know, the medication you're on and and um, if there's any changes made, how, you know, to, to, to be uh, really uh, mindful in terms of, you know, um, the sleep pattern change. Um, a lot of, because, you know, providers are not um, fairy tale. you know, they, uh, p providers are counting on their clients to feed them those um, information. And what uh, the example you just um, shared beautifully uh, exemplify um, that how uh, this kind of information would be helpful, um, not only for self-care, but also when it comes to the treatment discussion. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Are there any other questions for Dr. Tang? I think you covered things so, oh, here we go. Somebody asked, uh, is this presentation online anywhere? Mm -hmm. <coughs> and we'll be, we'll be emailing it out to you if you would like it. Hi, my name's Terry. Um, I don't know how to, uh, may I ask the question verbally? Sure. Okay. Um, I'm wondering uh, what the doctor thinks about the use of uh, melatonin uh, as a tablet form, which is readily available uh, over the counter. Melatonin for um, assisting uh, in sleeping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Um, so, mel yeah, yes, melatonin is the over-counter medication and a lot of people are using it to help regulate their sleep. And, um, and I would say, um, understand, the, understand how medic, uh, melatonin works will be a key because um, we talk about um, how our internal clock is um, sensitive to the light and uh, light and darkness and then how darkness can trigger this uh, 
our internal natural melatonin secretion. So the over-the-counter melatonin can help boost that melatonin um, uh, uh, spike in the evening in preparation for our sleep. So, you know, taking the over-the-counter melatonin, um, I would recommend a couple of things. One is uh, pay attention to the timing uh, when you take the over-the-counter melatonin, um, possibly around the dinner time, so, so that um, it allows our body a couple hours to prepare for the sleep because melatonin doesn't knock people out like some of the hypnotics. It just help us to um, get ready for the sleep um, induction. That's one. And the other is since um, melatonin is an over-the-counter uh, nutrient or vitamin or hormone, um, it's not FDA regulated. Um, so I would pay attention to the brand. Um, I would go with a larger brand name. And because it's not FDA approved, so um, a lot of time, the concentration of the substance in each tablet uh, may not accurately, uh, may not match with what's being stated on the label. And sometimes people take one brand, it works, but then when they switch to a different brand since it's on sale or um, then it doesn't work. Um, so kind of pay attention to the brand um, you're taking and the dosage. And usually people take uh, three to uh, three milligram or five milligram. Great question, Terry. Thank you. Um, would you be so bold as to uh, identify a brand that you might, that I might look for? Yeah, that, that's a tough question um, because it's not FDA regulated. So there, there's no uh, reference for us to base on. But um, so, yeah, I, you know, yeah, I, I would go with a larger brand name. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Dr. King? Don't be shy. Okay, well, if we have no more questions, I want to thank you, Dr. Tang, for an amazing and such an informative presentation. Thank you so, so much for, for doing this for us. We will thank be emailing everyone an evaluation form, and we would love it if you could um, get back to us with your feedback on this presentation, as well as um, any ideas and suggestions that you have for any future Zooms that we could do. Uh, we want to see what is of interest to you. And um, if you have any questions about the Lakeshore or would like to schedule a tour, please call us at 206 772 1200. Um, and just to let you know, later this month, we have another Zoom event. Um, it will be presented by the University of Washington Memory and Brain Wellness Center. The topic is How Aging Affects Brain Function and Thinking. So for more information on that event or to register, please give the community relations team a call. Again, I'm Lisa Almo. I'm the community relations representative here at the Lakeshore, and it concludes our today's presentation. Um, on behalf of the community relations team, Jane, Alicia, Lexi, and myself, I'd like to wish you all a wonderful rest of your day, and we look forward to seeing you at future events. Thank you so much for joining. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Dr. Thank you.